Welcome to Enviro Close Up. I am Carl Grossman. Photovoltaic energy. It's a technology waiting to happen. In fact, it's here already. With us is Stephen J. Strong. He's a noted expert in photovoltaics. He's the author of The Solar Electric House, and he's the president of What's the firm again? Solar? Design Associates. In Solar Harvard. Design Associates. It's based in Harvard, Massachusetts. And for those who claim that photovoltaics wouldn't work in cold, sometimes dark New England, Stephen Strong has shown that is not true. Steve, explain how photovoltaics work. Carl, photovoltaics are semiconductor devices. They're made primarily from silicon, which is the second most abundant element on Earth. It's refined from beach sand. We aren't going to run out of that anytime soon. The semiconductor device forms a crystalline structure, and the incoming photons in the solar energy knock electrons free from that crystalline structure, much like billiard balls in a collision. And those freed electrons are knocked up to a higher state of charge and have excess energy that they need to dissipate. The laws of physics dictate that they dissipate that energy and you just connect them to an external load and they do useful work. The beauty is that after the electrons go out and do useful work, they come right back to where they started from. People are familiar, I think, most everybody these days uh, has the solar calculators. Uh, some people have solar watches. People are used to, I think, photovoltaics on a small scale. On a large scale, how useful, how practical are they? They're very practical. The same basic technology that powers the wristwatch or your desktop calculator can power your house, industrial facility, or deliver gigawatt hour blocks of electrical energy into the nation's high voltage transmission distribution grids. Question. There's great promise to revolutionize society to kind of end the energy problem in many respects. How come the promise and the reality are so far apart? Well, the technology is here. We've been doing buildings powered by photovoltaics for nearly 15 years now. And of course, they've proven themselves to be very reliable by powering virtually every one of our space missions. The problem is not a technical one, Carl. It's really an issue of politics and political will. We could have cost-effective photovoltaics and widespread use very quickly if, as a society, we were willing to invest the resources necessary to bring the technology to the market and make the transition. And we haven't really been ready to do that. I think it would be good to look at some of the photos of some of the, uh, the homes that you've uh, really allowed to harvest the sun for free. Uh, let's just roll some slides. and Perhaps you could explain what we're looking at, Stephen. Carl, this first house is in Brookline, Massachusetts, uh, not too far from the studio, about uh, half an hour away. It has a roof of photovoltaic panels. It also has uh, solar thermal collectors integrated into the roof, as well as uh, clear glass for daylighting. It generates its electricity on site. It has a geothermal heat pump. It's earth sheltered, passive solar gain, passive solar cooling. And it is also utility interactive. And by that, I mean it uh, interfaces with the utility grid. And a surplus of electricity generated during the day is sold to the power company. And then you can get it back at night. And that eliminates the need for battery storage on site. And that house is basically energy independent. It is during the summer. During the winter, because of the size of the roof, and the size of the house, there is a deficit. So there's a surplus in the summer, a deficit in the winter. And in concept, you could be energy independent. And fortunately, in Massachusetts and many other states, because of the public utility regulations, you don't have to sell it. The beauty is that you can trade it, even mm -hmm. one for one. And so you have the benefit of the utility grid as a storage medium and it eliminates having to have your own batteries on site for storage. And it makes it much more efficient and also much less expensive to use let's, photovoltaics. Let's see the next house. The next house is in Carlisle, Massachusetts. It was uh, designed and built by our firm in 1980 with uh, cost sharing from the U.S. Department of Energy. It was the first 
full-size photovoltaic powered house in the country. It has seven and a half kilowatts of photovoltaics on the roof. It's an all-electric house and it, it too is utility interactive. There's no on-site storage. Surplus is generated during the day and at night or during cloudy weather. Uh, utility supplies power back. I understand that there have been enormous strides made in the technology of photovoltaics in recent years. Describe some of them. Well, one is the cost. The cost has come down by a factor of 100 in less than 20 years, which is a major accomplishment. Efficiency has improved. The uh, mass production capabilities have started to be implemented. The volume has dramatically increased over in recent years. Uh, the industry was growing at 20 or 25 percent a year uh, in the late 80s and early 90s. The potential is unbounded. More and more applications are being put into use every day in both the developed world and the less developed countries. Research is continuing. New processes are being worked on and perfected, and it's a very exciting time. What could people do to push the photovoltaic revolution along? Well, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of work to be done technically, and this requires the concentration of resources on this goal. It's like President Kennedy said, we will put a man on the moon. And we did that because we as a society were willing to invest our resources toward this goal, toward a focused goal. The Japanese are doing this and the Europeans are doing this. And so each individual can buy something photovoltaic and help the industry. You mentioned a number of products that are available now that are cost effective. And the other is to put some pressure on the politicians, especially your senators and congressmen that you want renewable energy. You don't want the nuclear budget to increase, which it has. You want the renewables budget to increase. And you want this present administration to support life-affirming technologies. If they get that message, then we will have that kind of political will and we'll have the kind of investment it takes. We can get there. Amen, Stephen J. Strong. This has been Enviro Close-Up. I'm Carl Grossman. Thanks for watching.